In this lecture, we're going to look at two concepts, soundness and cogency, which will bring our discussion of the concepts required for evaluating arguments to a completion. Soundness is a property of some deductively valid arguments, and cogency is a property of some inductively strong arguments. And so the ideas of soundness and cogency add to what we've already learned. And what we've already learned has to do with strength and validity, the evaluative concepts associated with induction and deduction. So we learned what makes an inductive argument strong or weak, and we learned what makes a deductive argument valid or invalid. Do not confuse these categories. There's no such thing as a valid inductive argument or a strong deductive argument. Induction is described in terms of strength and weakness only, and deduction in terms of being valid or invalid. Don't mix those up. So what we're going to do is a quick review of these concepts, and then we're going to extend these out and add the ideas of soundness and cogency, which should not be that difficult because these ideas don't really add anything new to what we've already learned. They just uh, add a few uh, additional elements and, and complete our discussion of evaluation. So let's begin with a quick review of what it means for a inductive argument to be strong. Remember, this test is a hypothetical test. When we are testing arguments for strength or validity, what we are not asking is, are the statements in the argument true or false? Or is the conclusion true or false? That really doesn't matter. What we are evaluating is the argument. Do the premises, if they were true, make the conclusion likely to be true? So the test is in a realm of hypothetical reasoning. We don't worry about whether or not the premises are true. We simply presume that they are and see if they support the conclusion or not. And that's what it means to evaluate the argument, not the statements in the argument. Let that sink in because a lot of people have a hard time grasping that idea. We're not, at, at least initially, interested in whether or not the statements in an argument are true or false, we're evaluating the argument. Okay, let's say that a inductive argument passes this first test. We take the premises, we pretend they're true, we assume they're true, and yes, if they were true, the conclusion would be probably true. Now, this is a first test. This tells us that the premises do support the conclusion they make the conclusion probable. But this in itself is not enough to conclude that this is a good argument or that the conclusion is true. It only allows us to determine if the premises were true, the conclusion probably would be true. So it's a provisional test, meaning an argument that is strong passes the first test. The premises would support the conclusion if they were true. But this does not tell us whether, whether or not the premises are true or whether or not the conclusion is true. In order to determine this, we need to apply a second test, and this is where the concept of cogency comes in. So keep this in mind. An inductive argument can be strong or weak. If it's weak, it's a bad argument. If it's strong, that doesn't mean it's necessarily good, but it has passed the first test, and we can then apply the second test, the test of cogency, which will determine if it's a good or a bad inductive argument. And that will be discussed in the next slide here. I think you'll be happy to know that the idea of cogency does not require us to learn anything new. It's actually a pretty simple property. Here's what it means. An inductive argument is cogent when First of all, it is strong. This is what I said earlier. Strength is a minimal condition. So once the argument is strong, then we go on to the second question, which is, are the premises of the argument actually true? Are they facts? Remember, to assess strength, 
we were content to remain within the realm of hypothetical truth. If the premises were true, where would they lead? Well, if the argument is strong, we know if the premises were true, the conclusion would probably be true. And then when we add the second aspect and determine, yes, in fact, the premises are true, put those two ideas together, and you get the idea that the conclusion of the argument is probably true, in fact, not merely hypothetically. So cogency adds the idea of truth to the conversation. Strength only required hypothetically assuming premises to be true, but to, in order to determine whether or not the argument is then cogent, we have to know the facts. So let's stop here and summarize. What does it mean to be cogent? Why is cogency better than just being strong? Well, if an argument is strong, we know that the conclusion is probably true if the premises are. But when an argument is cogent, we know that as well, but we know in addition that the premises are true. So put those two ideas together. If the premises were true, the conclusion would probably be true, and the premises are true. Therefore, it follows that the conclusion of a cogent argument is a probably true statement. Cogent arguments are the best inductive arguments. Um, if you can just determine that an argument is cogent, then you have a high degree of confidence in the conclusion. We know that it is probably a true statement. However, uh, this does place upon us a certain constraint, which is that we can't simply determine cogency in our armchair, thinking about it, as we can with strength. Strength is a conceptual test. Would the premises support the conclusion? Cogency adds the idea of truth, so it requires of us that we actually have factual knowledge. And this is where uh, uh, determining whether an argument is cogent is more complicated than determining whether or not it's strong. Arguments can be uncogent, inductive arguments that is, can be uncogent, first of all, when they are weak. Automatically a weak argument, if we determine it's weak, it's automatically uncogent. That's why it's a nice first test. Is the argument strong or weak? Well, if it turns out to be weak, we can ignore it. If it's strong, then we have to go on to the second test. Now, how can a strong argument be uncogent? Well, very simply, if it has at least one false premise. If one of the premises is actually false, not hypothetically false, but actually false, then even if the argument is strong, it will be uncogent and it will fail the second test. So determining that an argument is strong is a provisional test. If the argument passes that test, then we move to the test of cogency. And here the argument can still fail if it is strong but has an actually false premise or more than one false premise. That makes it uncogent and uncogent arguments are bad inductive arguments. I think a couple of examples might help to cement this point in our minds. Let's look at a couple of cogent or uncogent arguments. So here's an argument. It has rained in San Marcos at least once every December since weather has been recorded. So it will probably rain in San Marcos next December. Well, if that premise were true, if in fact it has rained in San Marcos at least once every December for say the last, oh, I don't know, 125 years, it would be very likely that it's going to rain in San Marcos next December. This is a prediction, and the conclusion of this prediction is likely if the premise were true. So it's a strong argument. Now the question is, is it a cogent argument? That requires that we determine, is it actually a fact that it has rained at least once every December in San Marcos since, time, uh, since weather has been recorded? throughout time? Well, we can't answer this simply by thinking about it. We would have to do research. We would have to go to a weather bureau, for example, and see and look at every December since they 
keep their records and determine is that statement actually true or not. This is quite a bit of work. And I think what you're starting to understand is assessing cogency is a lot more work than assessing strength because you actually have to gather the facts. Now I'm anticipating a question that's probably forming in your mind because it forms in every student's mind every time I teach this subject, which is how are you going to test us for cogency or soundness, which is it's going to come up real soon, on an exam? Because that requires that we have this factual knowledge at our fingertips, which we may not have. And so the answer to the question, how am I going to test you on strength and cogency, I mean, cogency and soundness, I should say, is, well, I'm really not going to. You have to understand what the concepts mean, but it would be unfair for me to ask you to come up with the factual knowledge you need to assess cogency or soundness. So learn the concept, understand that this is what makes a inductive or a deductive argument a good one, but also understand that I'm not going to have any test questions on is this argument cogent or is this argument sound? You're going to have a lot of questions that ask is this argument strong or weak, valid or invalid, because those concepts don't require factual knowledge. So here's another argument. The population of the Earth is currently around 7.5 billion people and is growing rapidly. So the population of the Earth will probably hit 8 billion people soon. Okay, so first of all, we assess this argument to see if it's strong or weak. And I think we would agree this is a pretty strong argument. If it were true that there are 7.5 billion people on the Earth, it seems pretty likely that there will be 8 billion people pretty soon. So the premise, if it were true, would make the conclusion true. So it's strong. Next question, is it actually true that there are around 7.5 billion people on the Earth? Well, you may not know this off the top of your head. I had to look it up as well when I was writing this question. And it turns out that there at this moment are about 7.49 billion people. So just around 7.5 billion people. So that means that premise is actually true. We know that if the premise were true, it would make the conclusion true, probably. And the premise is true. So therefore, you have a strong argument with an actually true premise, making this a cogent argument. So now let's shift to deductive arguments and learn the concept of soundness. And fortunately, everything that we've already learned just transfers over to deductive arguments, except here we're talking about uh, whether the argument is valid or invalid rather than strong or weak. So when we assess a deductive argument, again, all we're assessing at that first stage is would the premises, if true, make the conclusion necessarily true? That's the difference between deduction and induction. Deduction is about necessity. In other words, if we accepted those premises, would we have to accept the conclusion? So what, it, what this is telling us is, does the argument's premises, do the argument's premises support the conclusion or not? So we're assessing the whole argument the support relationship between premises and conclusion. That tells us if the argument is valid or invalid. But this tells us nothing about whether or not the premises are in fact true, or if the conclusion is in fact true. This is where we have to take the next step, just as we did with the step of cogency. But here, with a deductive argument, we take the step to the concept of soundness. But the idea of soundness is very simple. A sound deductive argument is, first of all, valid with one additional property. It's a valid argument and the premises are actually true. They are facts. They are not merely hypothetically or assumed to be true. So now we need to put these ideas together. Why is a sound argument the best kind of deductive argument? Well, because we know, since it's sound, 
that it's valid, meaning the premises would support the conclusion if they were true, and we know they're true. So if you put those two ideas together, you realize that the conclusion of a sound argument must be true. It has to be the case. This is why, for example, we are able to do things like proofs in geometry and establish conclusions that are absolutely necessarily true and that no one disputes. Why? Because these are the result of arguments that are valid with true premises if the proof is a good one. So valid deductive arguments are provisionally good sound deductive arguments are the best and those are what we are ultimately looking for but again just like with cogency soundness requires that we establish what is actually true or not which is a burden that is a higher standard than merely assuming the premises are true so when is an argument unsound when is a deductive argument unsound well, first of all, it's unsound if it's invalid. That's why testing an argument to determine if it's valid or invalid is useful, because if it's invalid, we can simply discard it. If the, if the argument, however, turns out to be valid, then we have to move to the second level of testing and ask, does it actually have true or false premises? Now, a valid argument can still fail, and it can fail if it is unsound. When is it unsound? When the valid argument has an actually false premise, at least one or more. Because valid means simply, if the premises were true, they would support the conclusion, but it's unsound because if it has a false premise, the premises are not in fact true. So therefore, a unsound argument is a deductive argument that fails. So just like cogency, soundness is a pretty simple idea. Let's look at a couple of deductive arguments and see if we can assess them for soundness. Abraham Lincoln was president of the United States during the Civil War. Therefore, he was commander in chief of the US Army. This is a deductive argument and it is a argument based on definition. By definition, the president of the United States is the commander in chief of the US Army. That's what it means in part to be the chief executive. So the argument is valid. If it were true that Lincoln was president during the Civil War, then it would have to be the case that he was commander in chief of the US Army. So valid argument. Now the next question is, is it actually true that Abraham Lincoln was president of the United States during the Civil War? And yes, in fact, it is a, it is a true claim. Right? So the premise is true. If the premise were true, the conclusion would be true. So therefore, this is a sound argument with a true conclusion. Now you can see, however, the limitations and the challenges of soundness, just like with cogency. In order to determine if the argument is sound, you would have to know, in fact, that Lincoln was president during this time. You may or may not have known that. So therefore, I'm not going to be testing you by giving you arguments and asking to tell me asking you to tell me if they're sound or not, because that would be an unfair constraint. However, you don't have to know anything about US history to know that this is at least a valid argument. And here's another example of an argument. The English alphabet has 26 letters, therefore it has an even number of letters. First of all, we assess this argument to determine is it valid or invalid. If it were the case that the English alphabet had 26 letters, could it be false that it has an even number of letters? No, it could not be false because 26 is an even number. So this is a valid argument. Now we go to the next step. In fact, does the English alphabet have 26 letters? And the answer is yes. So here we have a valid argument with an actually true premise Therefore, it is a sound argument. The conclusion is necessarily true. So to reiterate a point I've made several times throughout this lecture, the challenge of determining either soundness of a deductive argument or cogency of an inductive argument has to do with the idea of truth. We have to be able to determine 
whether or not a given premise or set of premises are actually true statements. Now, sometimes we can do this by appealing to common sense. Um, so if I ask you, is it true that the length of your pinky finger is less than your height? You don't have to do any research to determine, yes, that's actually a true statement. You just have to apply common sense. Now, sometimes we have to do a bit of research to figure out if a claim is true. Like if we don't know whether or not Abraham Lincoln was president during the Civil War. Or if I asked you, is it actually true that the sun is 93 million miles away from the earth? Well, a little bit of research would tell you that both of those claims are in fact true. Lincoln was president during the Civil War, and the sun in fact is 93 million miles away from earth. And sometimes we just have to trust experts to determine whether or not a claim is true because it lies beyond the realm of most of our capacities to determine. Like if you are uh, making an argument and uh, in physics, let's say, and the idea of the Higgs boson comes up and one of the premises says the Higgs boson actually exists. Well, for you to determine if that's true or false would require a relatively high level of expertise. So soundness and cogency present challenges to us because they require that we know the actual truth. Sometimes we can do this, sometimes it's easy, sometimes we could do it with a little bit of research, and sometimes we have to rely on experts. That's why there are experts. They have a body or basis of factual knowledge that can serve to confirm whether or not premises are actually true or actually false. And finally, to put a kind of a philosophical spin on this whole conversation, there are some claims that it doesn't seem possible to know if they are true or false. They must be one or the other, but it seems to be beyond the realm of human limitation to determine whether or not they are true or false. And this would include metaphysical claims like, does the soul survive death or does God exist? Both of those statements must be either true or false, but no one seems to know which is the case. And so therefore, in these kinds of arguments, these kind of metaphysical arguments, we are left at the level of validity or strength because soundness and cogency lie beyond our capacity. At least at this stage, uh, maybe there's a higher level of existence where these questions all get answered. Um, but right now, here and now on the earth, we can't know whether or not those premises that make up those arguments are true or not. So there are limits to soundness and cogency. However, uh, let's not use that as a blanket statement that we can never assess soundness or cogency. There are some outlier difficult questions that are hard to determine if the answers are true or false. But that set of questions is really pretty tiny in comparison with the vast realm of information that we can acquire and that we can use to reason soundly. So in conclusion, determining soundness and cogency is constrained by our limitations, by our inability in at least a few cases to assess the truth. To the extent we can, that's good. We can assess whether an argument is sound or cogent. But however, sometimes a question lies beyond this ability. Now, having concluded our conversation about soundness and cogency, in the next presentation, I'm going to look at um, uh, the last topic in evaluating arguments. We're going to look at arguments that are of slightly greater length, more extended arguments. You'll be happy to know we don't have to learn anything new to evaluate extended arguments, but we want to be able to apply the skills we have acquired to arguments of greater length than merely a sentence or two. I've been using arguments of that length to illustrate principles, but now we need to stretch and apply what we've learned to longer arguments, somewhat longer arguments, and that'll be in the next presentation.